future now show. Brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Future Now show. Today, we're discussing IoT and what's to come with innovator, academic, consultant, and futurist, Peter Cochran. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us today. A pleasure. So what is the Internet of Things? Can you explain some characteristics of IoT? Sure. Um, you have to think um, very broadly uh, about what we're trying to do here. And the, the principle is that we're trying to create a sustainable society, which means we want to be able to reuse, repurpose uh, items that are expensive um, and use uh, rare materials. And um, we, we want to be able to recover the raw materials as well. Now, at the moment, um, Everything that is manufactured is done more or less anonymously. Um, as the uh, as things come down the production production line, they have what we would call travelers. There's a record of where the materials came from, who processed the materials, who's machined them, who's stuck them together, assembled, test, and so on. And then that process dies. Um, it can be embedded in things like a laptop or a mobile phone or indeed an automobile. But for things like, uh, shall we say, doorbells or um, uh, hi-fi systems or, or uh, other inconsequential bits of technology that we use, our clothing, our food, everything that we possess and use, consume, that has the potential to be recycled uh, in the broadest possible sense, um, is lost to us if we don't know where it is, what it is, what it contains, and uh, the, the whole process. So the dream is, and it's becoming a reality, there are about 30 billion items out there that have been uh, tagged with details. They're on the Internet of Things. Some people like to call it the Internet of Everything because we now have people uh, in Sweden who are being chipped. A lot of the young people are, are opting to be chipped so uh, uh, they can carry things like their passport, their uh, entry details, their, um, pa uh, their uh, ID, uh, uh, whatever, uh, it, with a chip under the skin. So you, you have to think forward a few years and say, well, how big can this thing get? Now, most of the pundits come up with numbers like 70 or 80 or 100 billion uh, items in the whole of the world. And we can do that with technologies like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, 4, 5, possibly 6G. Uh, and what's the problem? Uh, my contention is the number is going to be much more like 1, 2 or 3 trillion. Okay, so in mathematical terms, from 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12, a, a big, big difference. Now, when you get that kind of thought, you start to look at things like the energy consumption of the wireless network. Now, right off today, we've got this very interesting story where... Um, the, the original uh, analog mobile networks were consuming only a, a few hundred watts on their towers. And then when we, uh, we got uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, the energy requirements progressively went up. And we're now at an unholy level with 5G. In China, some of their towers are consuming between 10 and 20 kilowatts. Now, this is a lot of energy. If you say, well, uh, the nation needs, um, in China's case, they need about a million towers. Uh, in the UK's case, you need about um, um, just over 100,000 or, or so. And you say, well, let's have 10 kilowatts, 100,000. Oh, we need to build some more nuclear power stations to power up this mobile network. Uh, if we are going to add 
um, the IoT onto this network, it's not tenable because the IoT things that we are using today are using the power levels of a mobile phone or, or some device like that, about half a watt for the radio signal. And then there's the signal processing. So they may be a, a watt or two each. Now, start multiplying that uh, by uh, two or three trillion, and um, it's not a tenable solution to use those kinds of technologies. So I've had a look at this with my research colleagues, and we've done some calculations, and uh, we think we have a, a really neat solution. Uh, and the neat solution is mesh nets, mm -hmm. so mesh networks, no infrastructure at all. And so the, the signal that's emanating from my IoT device, which may be this, or indeed it may be a pacemaker um, or some other device, could hop human to human, unit to unit, and find its way to the destination. It might choose at some point to be aggregated with other messages and go up to 4 or 5G or 6G and go down the wireless network, but as an aggregate process. So that, that's the vision, if you like. It's only just dawning on uh, the telecommunications industry that they've got a big energy problem. And uh, one of the big changes in my lifetime is the projects have gone from being management, sorry, from being engineering and science led to being management led. And so uh, a characteristic of this is there's no great a forethought or understanding, and then they implement something and dis discover that they've got a lot of energy problems, okay? Where is IoT heading by looking at past trends? When asked this question, I, I generally cite Moore's law, uh, the exponential growth of technology. It's not just the integrated circuits, but it is actually our ability to create the integrated technology en masse at very low prices that enables just about everything in our tech world. So for the IoT, we see a growth curve that is following the same trend as Moore's law, quite a bit behind it, but it's up at 30 billion right now. If we project forward, then uh, I can justify numbers like two and a half trillion. So let me give you a few items from my sample list. And my favorite is seagoing containers. Uh, we lose something of the order of one uh, to two, sometimes 3,000 a year due to accidents and storms, freak waves. Uh, if a ship is rolling excessively, the captain will eject uh, containers from the top layer to stabilize the ship. Now, if that's your container, you do not know it's disappeared. There is no communication between the ship and the container and you. Now, if those containers are going to be part of the IoT, you can do that by having container to container to ship communication. So you have to imagine that uh, well over 75% of all the containers is inside, if you'd like to call it a Faraday cage, they, they're isolated from the world. There's a layer of metal containers around the inner ones. Uh, something like a third of the containers can be below deck. And But what you can do is allow the containers to talk to each other. You can then talk to the ship. The ship can then do ship to shore with the data. And you will know that your containers just disappeared and you need to take action. If you're a construction company and uh, all the furniture for equipping uh, a new hotel just went to the bottom of the sea, you've got to make alternative arrangements fast if you're going to stick to schedule. So those those kind of industries are looking for solutions. Now, there's much, much more. Uh, if you look at food packaging, 
and uh, clothes tagging, um, it is actually quite uh, a transformation of those industries to be able to read um, what something is and where it is. So let me give you one example from the retail industry. Supposing you go into a store and you are buying something for business and you need a summer blouse and you need a smart skirt to go with it. So you go into the store, the blouse is exactly what you want. Unfortunately, the skirt is the wrong color. Now, if it's a man um, and, and he's buying a shirt and, and trousers, he will just say, well, that's it, walk out. Uh, ladies might approach it slightly differently. Uh, they may say, I'll go and hunt for a skirt somewhere else. But what if that store could say to you, um, we have this uh, skirt in the right color for you, uh, but it's in a city 200 miles away. We can FedEx it to you tomorrow. They've got a sale. They've immediately got a sale. Now, they can't do that right now, but when, if they had IoT tagging, then they would be able to do it because they'd be able to do uh, an itinerary check uh, very, very much faster. Uh, there are many uh, others, um, things like um, car tires or car components. Uh, supposing, uh, and I had this happen to me uh, just 18 months ago, I was involved in a crash where my car was written off. Now, wouldn't it be jolly useful to know that the uh, the engine was a write-off, the front wheels are a write-off, but hey, the electric motors uh, and the battery and the tires at the back can be reused because the car was only three months old. <laughs> at the moment, that kind of opportunity does not exist. Right. But if we if we could actually um, know uh, about uh, the materials and their condition and their usage, then they could be taken off uh, and, and put back into the usage cycle. So there's just an endless list of these things that create a big market for the IoT. And the reason is, everybody benefits it's it's a win-win situation it, it's a win for the manufacturer it's a win for the user or the owner and it's a win for society and best of all it's a win for the planet we are using less material achieving um more and wasting the the amounts of energy that we currently waste so that's that's a, a sort of broad brush picture very quickly that is such a great idea. You are so correct. It's you get into an accident, they look at the car, and they could absolutely make use of certain parts of the car. But instead, it just sent, it goes to a scrapyard or it's written off, and right. it's a it's a mess. I mean, so why aren't we doing this now? Is it a regulatory issue, or or what is it? Um, I think I think that. Uh... We have known, um, in fact, uh, it, there was a report um, way back in the 70s pointing out that the uh, planet has got a finite uh, source of materials. Uh, there's a finite amount of energy. The climatic uh, system is uh, quite fragile, and uh, we're now proving that for real. But it seems that our species uh, is only motivated to do anything when we're right on the edge of the cliff. <laughs> it's, too, it's too easy, it's too comfortable to have uh, business uh, as usual. And um, the, the other component of this, by the way, is uh, new materials. Um, we, we don't have an energy generation problem. We really do not. We have an energy storage problem. That's mm. the critical problem. It's the amount of um, uh, energy we can store per given volume that is the real killer. Now, if we're, if we're going to solve that, it's going to be on the back of nanotechnology. 
it may well be a hybrid solution that is uh, a combination of uh, bio biology and hard uh, materials. Um, but when we've done that, uh, we want to be able to recover those materials and reuse them. And we know we want to know what state they're in. Without, you know, if we if we get a, a battery out of uh, a car and um, we have to take it to pieces, not knowing what we're going to find in there, that's bad news. That that's going to be surprises and it's going to cost money. If we know that that battery is actually in quite good shape and um, it's only capable of performing at three quarters of its manufactured intended performance, there may well be people uh, in the older community who would be very happy to pay for that and reuse it because they don't travel very far. And it stretches, it stretches the lifetime of products like batteries and everything else to improve our efficiency of manufacture and use. It will reduce energy. Um, I have another dream. You might like this, but we have um, uh, <laughs> we have materials that uh, now self repair. They're programmable for color. They store energy, and uh, they don't get dirty. They they just do not um, let uh, dirt and, and grime stick to them. And so I want my car made out of that material, so I don't have to wash it anymore. <laughs> Same. I, that sounds amazing. Where, yeah. where do we get one? <laughs> <laughs> the snag is that, um, and, and the, I have to say, the automotive industry are stepping up to the plate with experimenting with all of this stuff. Uh, they're really pushing hard. Uh, but if you imagine, uh, you go to the supermarket and uh, somebody lets a trolley slip and it scratches down the side of your car, but by the time you get home, it's self-healed, Wow, you don't have to go to the body shop and get it sprayed anymore. That would be a terrific saving. Um, if we could store energy where we actually need it rather than remotely and having wires to carry it to the point of use, that would be pretty good too. So there's a lot of technology that's coming in from all kinds of directions that demand an internet of things. They demand that the technologies become smart, and they talk to each other, and they collaborate. Uh, and that's basically uh, the direction. It's not a dream. It's actually evolving. But it's um, uh, there are interesting challenges, and um, the wireless network is one. I have to tell you that nothing much has happened in wireless since 1915. The technologies that we're using are pretty much the same. What has actually happened is what we call digital radios are really analog radios with modems stuck on the end. It's the equivalent of having uh, copper wire with modems on the end and calling it a digital link. It's really an analog link. And um, there, there are technologies that we can use that transform uh, the way we uh, communicate. And the, my favorite is ultra wideband. So if we go back in time, um, before 1915 and the birth of electronics, um, people were using a Morse key and a spark transmitter. And so everybody could hear the signal at the same time. Uh, and so it was chaos. And uh, the, the, there'd be, let's see, a ship close to you and he would just deafen you and you wouldn't be able to hear anything else. Well. Ultra wideband is the equivalent of that, but instead of a Morse key, we use a an encryption key that spreads the signal so that they can live in the same frequency space. We can separate them out. So this um, this is, to my mind, the leap forward that we need, and it, it's revolutionary because all of a sudden you no link no longer need bands and channels to to allocate for the signals uh, and uh, government are pushed off the scene the regulators pushed off the scene because you can communicate under the thermal noise level and so you, you've got immediate security 
on a level that uh, we've not seen before, and it uses less energy. The snag is it really only uh, can only really do it over a, a fairly short period. If uh, sorry, a very short distance. If we are going for a very large IoT, and that in itself is a plus because we can only allow a very small amount of energy for the transmissions. That says we can't go very far. And so a highly dense IoT where the signal can hop from one person or one mode or one vehicle or one device to another naturally ticks all the boxes. So that, that that's the whole picture that I've, I've now given you. Um, and it, it's... Um, I've actually proven that this stuff will work. It's just getting industry to realize and to pick it up uh, and run with it. So I've given um, <clears throat> I've given I think three presentations on behalf of Ofcom uh, on this topic uh, in the UK, um, and I've uh, given one or two public lectures. And uh, I've just published uh, a paper, um, which uh, I, I'm still getting feedback on. So it's um, it's an interesting challenge. I, I always think that uh, the only change, uh, sorry, the only human that likes change is a wet baby. <laughs> most, most people, most people react badly to any form of change it's uncomfortable for us to change things. very true yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh i know it is it's it's concerning uh how much pushback there is in regards to innovation and uh yep. even uh smart city projects for example you yep. know um there's been several projects that have been attempted and uh, the the fears and concerns of people have really inhibited any of those uh, projects from coming to fruition. For example, uh, yeah. Toronto, there was Google and Sidewalk Labs, and I think it was about a, a two thousand uh, two thousand uh, foot area uh, acre area that was supposed to have been developed into this uh, smart city. Uh, you know, urban experience with robo taxis, heated sidewalks, autonomous garbage collection, uh, and a whole digital layer that was supposed to monitor everything from like street crossings to park bench usage, everything. And instead, you, there was just so many people in fear and, and freaking out and, and writing articles and shouting out about it. They, yeah. you know, they shut the whole pro program yeah. down. And now instead, uh, they're, they're saying, wait, you know, instead of, uh, we're going to make it a more people centric approach. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? I, well, I think um, uh, science fiction writers and Hollywood have a, a part to play here. They, uh, the, the good news story, this is going to change your life, is, uh, and, and you know, here are all the benefits, is not really a cool story. What's a cool story is this, uh, this technology is evil, it's coming for you. It, it's going to kill you. It's going to be painful, and there's nothing you can do about it. it which is is the uh, sort of subtitle of of all the uh, uh, Hollywood uh, programs or, or movies like Terminator and uh, and that sort of thing. So people like to be scared. The snag is they stop thinking, and I think we've got another massive uh, problem, and that is. Uh, an education system that is not equipping people for the rate of change that we're now experiencing. Um, people will, uh, people have always reacted to change and they've always reacted badly. And I, I would cite the Toll Puddle Martyrs, you know, the uh, Cotton Jenny. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what technology, right now it's AI. You know, AI is going to take over. And I keep trying to get over people that our relationship with AI will be entirely symbiotic. Um, it's like, uh, and the paradox is that they uh, communicate, they write, and they complain about everything that's technological whilst using a supercomputer and a mobile phone that's more powerful than Seymour's 
Gray's supercomputer in 1987. <laughs> it just <laughs> cracks me up. Hey, they're actually complaining about what they're using every day. And um, I sometimes tease audiences and I say to them, OK, uh, you're, you're worried about this technology. Uh, you, you don't want to be tracked and, and all of these things. And it, it knows where you are and what you're doing. Let's go back in time. We'll destroy all this technology. At what point do we start destroying it? Now, now think about it. Well, how far back would you go? Well, should we destroy all the X-ray machines? Or MRI scanners? By the way, AI is controlling and processing all the MRI scanners. It's detecting cancer because humans and not that good at pattern recognition. Uh, and let's see uh, who decoded the, the genome. It wasn't humans, it was AI. Mm -hmm. In all of our history, we have managed as a species to decode one less than 100 protein uh, folding uh, patterns. And in two months, AI has decoded over 200 million. Now, why is that important? Because the combination of the genome and the protein defines most ailments and where most cures are going to be. And why would we want quantum computers, for example? Because the root cause of cancer, in my view, okay, I'll, I'll just qualify that in my view, is a communications error between genome and protein. And the, the definition of cancer is the uncontrolled and useless growth of cells. And so if you get a failure of communication, now we can't, we can't decode that communication path using digital computers. It's a massively complex. It's far more complex than decoding. Genome is relatively easy to decode. Uh, protein is the devil, and the communication between the two is the devil incarnate. You know, I mean, it's a real, real big challenge scientifically, but we can save lives, we can reduce suffering, and we have done successfully. Um, I mean, a, another good example would be the number of um, women and uh, girls now who are being saved by AI applied to mammograms because human beings just can't do it. And I, I very often say to audiences, if you want to characterize AI by its single greatest quality capability, it is the best pattern recognition tool we ever created. That's basically it. Now, there's yes. all these arguments about it's becoming smart, it's becoming intelligent, it's becoming sentient, and it's going to take over and it's going to control us. Well, how do you feel about coming into Heathrow on a triple uh, seven, and uh, there's an AI system landing it, and the pilot's having a coffee just watching it? And I can tell you, if you come in to Heathrow and you have a really rough landing, that's because it's a human being flying the machine instead of the robot. So all the smooth landings you get are robots. All the bouncy ones are human beings. So where do you want to stop? It's, it's not an argument that you can nail. So are there risks? Always. But people seem to want, and there's no certainty. They, I, I feel very sad for a, a lot of people. They don't understand the scientific method, the ethos, and the opportunity, but they want certainty. And if you want certainty, uh, adopt a religion and become ignorant. If you want a future, you have to go with the best evidence that we've got, and that comes out of science, period. It's a challenge for them, but the education system doesn't equip them for this kind of thinking. I have to also say that we ought to lay a little bit of blame 
for those who sensationalize everything. And mm. uh, the media, for one, always jump on the bandwagon. And I have to say that there are now uh, scientists and engineers who jump on the bandwagon of sensual, sensual, sensationalizing what they've done in order to generate funding. <laughs> so, Very much so. You know, nobody's got clean hands here. And, and it, it's, it's just the, uh, the, the human condition. Um, my interest is solely in what is the truth and how can we improve the lot of mankind. It's not as if we have got equitable standards of living across the world, not even across Europe or across the United States. And until we achieve some kind of equitable standard of living, we won't see an end to wars and violence and uh, all the other bad things that happen. So I, I have witnessed uh, many things in my life, but I'll give you a very graphic example. My grandfather was a coal miner. He went down the coal mine to join his mother when he was 11 years old. In his gene pool was um, heart failure and uh, diabetes. So um, my brother has not seen any of this, but I have. <laughs> Only oh. he, he couldn't walk because he couldn't breathe. And um, he... Um, he got diabetes he couldn't control. He also got cataracts and he couldn't see. And all of these have been fixed for me by modern medicine. And that's just in my lifetime. Um, when, I, when I was born, uh, antibiotics were only just becoming available. So I think people tend to see the past with rose-tinted glasses. I see the future with rose tinted glasses, perhaps. Mm. I can see a world that's better now than it was when I was a child, period. Um, I don't fear technology. I fear people. I mm. really do worry about what my species is going to do next. I don't worry about what the technology is going to do next. The technology is principally inert. Uh, if we, and we are doing this, by the way, if we build a, an anthropomorphic robot, give it a gun and teach it to shoot people, do not be surprised if it gets very efficient at shooting people. <laughs> it will. Should, should we be teaching... It doesn't seem to me to be a very good idea, but that's the nature of the human being. And right. For example, we had chat GPT, and then someone creates a, a diabolical version of it, chaos GPT. Yep. Right? And it's it's the people. You're entirely correct on that. It's concerning. Um, the dark side of the force, the, the, the criminals and the hackers are now using AI to create new attack formats. And they've, they've actually been using that for a long time. Um, and, and it was, okay, um, I always tell my students this story. You know, um, way, way back, the human race were knocking nails in with their fist. And one of the guys had a great idea. He got a rock and he started banging nails in with a, with a rock, but it still hurt your hand and the rock broke. And so they mounted a three-year R&D program and the engineers came up with a hammer. And the engineers were heroes because now the human race could build everything very efficiently because they got a hammer and they got a nail. But one day, some guy decides to kill his wife with a hammer. Now the engineers have invented a murder weapon. That, that's exactly what happens with all this technology. We build something with all the right intentions, but somebody decides to use it to do bad, and all of a sudden people turn on the technology. 
it's it's not a technological problem it's a people problem it really is it is so going back to ai and iot what are some ways that we'll see ai and iot kind of converge more so in the future okay let me tell you about intelligence and sentience okay so <clears throat> From a chaotic universe, um, stardust, emerged um, life itself. Now, every time we look at a rock from somewhere in space, we break it open, and in a large proportion of uh, cases, they, there are the essential acids for making DNA. And so it's not so much that you and I are related to uh, chimpanzees, or it's more we're related to a blade of grass because every living entity on this planet uses the same form of DNA. Okay, so you get life. The next thing that it starts to do is to communicate and life always exhibits even uh, single cells are intelligent. So you start to bring lots of cells together and you get greater and greater intelligence. Uh, once you've got intelligence, then you get some kind of entity that can interact with the environment and change the environment. And then you get sentience. We're now seeing that story repeated only we have created, our species has created this D, new DNA in silicon, if you like. So we create these chips, we create robots. And uh, at the moment, my laptop uh, is, uh, uh, my postulation here is where my laptop is stationary. And because it can't move around, it cannot be sentient like me. So if, if something is going to be sentient like us, it has to be able to see, hear, smell, feel, move, and do all the things that we do. Now, it doesn't mean to say my laptop could not be sentient or intelligent with AI, but it lives in a network world that we don't live in. Yeah. And so it turns out from mathematical analysis that the biggest component of... Um, sentience is the ability to manipulate and the ability to sense the eyes so um humans are incredibly arrogant in the way that they compare their abilities to other animals and other machines and so i say to them a whale is far smarter than any human being when it's in the sea. If I drop you in the sea with a whale, you will not survive. The whale will. If I put the whale on, line, on land, it will die, but we will survive. However, if I take a city trader from New York and put him on the Serengeti plane, he will not last very long. And if I was to take a native from the Serengeti plane and put him into New York, he'd probably get hit by a yellow cow. So <clears throat> you have to look at intelligence and sentience in the context of the environment in which that species, that entity lives. And so somebody said to me just three days ago, AI will never be smarter than us. I said, well, excuse me. Uh, there is not a board game that you can find, including Go, that we can now win at against a computer. So in computing terms, AI is smarter than us on specific things. Protein folding, superior to us. Uh, disease diagnosis, it's superior to us. Now, we've been here before. It was called the early stages of computing. If you had a company and you wanted a payroll computer, you bought a payroll computer. Every computer did one job. That's where computing started. 
we're repeating that history. Every AI does one job, one job only, and does it really well. Now, what do we do as a species? We do many, many jobs adequately. We do them adequately. It's sufficiently accurate. It's sufficiently good. Um, there's quite a lot of things that the human race do that I cannot do. I cannot play a musical instrument. I cannot compose music. I cannot write poetry. But someone can. Someone can. Someone can do it. So I, have, I don't have a problem with any of this. But people will stand there and say, this computer or this uh, robot isn't as intelligent as human beings. No, it is in some things. Um, we now have computers that, uh, sorry, robots that are superior at playing think, uh, games like tennis or snooker. You know, QED, I think. Sooner or later, we will get some kind of aggregation that gives us a general purpose AI system. But as soon as it becomes general purpose doing everything, like us, it will be sacrificing some percentage of accuracy or goodness, if you will. It will become more and more humanoid. And by the way, I mean, we might as well frighten people to death. We are becoming more and more machine. So the number of my friends that have got pacemakers or respiratory stimulators or Alzheimer's uh, offset uh, chips, um, so far, um, the only bit of um, uh, cyborg is uh, a lens in this eye, but I've got to have another one because I've had cataracts and... Uh, you know, I'm not too worried. I'm made of artificial parts. Uh, so I've got set, you know, so where do you stop? Some of my friends have lost an arm or a leg, and they have an artificial arm or leg. So many years ago, I played a game with my wife. We were driving the length of the UK, and I uh, I said to her, uh, "You know, if we have an accident in a minute." and I lose a leg, will you still love me? And she says, of course I will. Okay. So it was a weird conversation. So uh, yeah. I waited for a while and said to her, you know, if we have another accident and uh, I lose an arm, of course I will still love you. Hmm. Okay. What, what, what if I, I have to have an artificial heart? And I kept doing this, you know, and, uh, artificial kidney and and so on. And at some point, she said, just a minute, I'm not having you dying by installment, which I thought was a great quote. And so it's a sort of fine line. At what point does someone who subsumes technology cease to be human? And at what point does a machine that assumes human capabilities become a human entity? And there's, there's a crossover point there that's going to be very interesting. I'm not going to live to see it, but I do believe that my children or my grandchildren will see this sort of thing happen, providing the human race don't do something really stupid in the meantime. Indeed. I mean, it's just so interesting. Uh, I'm sure you grew up watching it you know i even watched it as well the jetsons right yep. it was uh, the show that we all saw as this amazing vision of the future and when you look at the jetsons today it's got iot all over i mean <laughs> yes. every part of it but the only thing you don't see is the technology embedded in their bodies right yep. they engage you know uh Judy gets her hair done by the hair machine. Uh, they have the robot butler, Rosie, right? And every single part is connected, but there's that lacking element where they're still human, but everything's working for them, yep. you know? 
I do, do, I, do that... I do think that um, you know, the, the basic ethos of what we're doing should be um, uh, the technology should uh, uh, be improving our lives and our condition. Uh, they sh it should be helping us and not the other way around. So uh, I, um, I don't like technology that makes me work. I, mm -hmm. I like technology that works for me. So I, I can't abide poor interfaces. And um, sometimes I get a challenge with a, a car that I drive or um, a dishwasher that I load or a washing machine or whatever, or a TV set or a hi-fi. And you think, um, <clears throat> you know, I could, um, I could certainly uh, have a few words with the designer. It's not the technology's fault, but the human interface. Um, you, you must see it. I, my, one of my favorite hates is uh, seeing people's uh, uh, slideshow. They go to a conference, they put up a slideshow, and their slides have got blue on purple. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I can't read it. You know, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't read it. Or uh, the, 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 they've got it in something like six point, and uh, they stand up and they say, oh, I'm sorry you can't read this. Well, I'm sorry you came. You know, I mean, why do it? And I feel the same about the interfaces with the technology. Um, I'd like to see this QWERTY keyboard disappear, and I'd like to see uh, an ability to talk more. I, I use uh, voice to text a lot, um, and um, I've got one or two uh, semi-blind uh, and uh, incredibly deaf uh, friends who uh, I've equipped with uh, the technology to help them. So you know, being able to do your email by listening to it and then talk back to it and all that sort of thing is great. And um, Absolutely. I, I always find it paradoxical uh, that probably the best uh, voice I.O. we've got at the moment came out of Amazon, you know, a, a retail operation, creates something quite extraordinary. The, so it... it I, I just think it, it's kind of uh, wonderful that we can look after people and make their lives better by an appropriate use of technology. That's it. And if somebody offers me a chip so I don't have to carry keys or a passport, I will say, yes, please. <laughs> here's, the, here's the key thing. It's okay whilst it's an individual choice. If it becomes mandatory, then it's repressive. But in itself, if it's my choice to be chipped, uh, as they are in Sweden, that's my problem. It's nobody else's. So I don't, I don't see why anybody else should get alarmed about it. And they're not going to do it to them. Yes. You know, it, it should be a choice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't think that uh, there should be pressure from any side, whether it be from a government or a organization to particularly put it on the people, but it should be introduced as a means to uh, make things more streamlined. You know, um, in a lot of ways, we have had a stalled century. Mm -hmm. We have technology to evolve. We can do better. So it would be great to see IoT, AI, and these technologies help us create a better future that's more free. <laughs> I've got uh, one, two. I got five AI systems in here that I use all the time, and they make my life easier. They help me to be creative. Um, you know, uh, anybody who's been a writer uh, or a developer of anything knows the tyranny of the blank page or the blank screen you sit there and if you can get um if you can get uh, just uh, a hint of something that starts you off writing or whatever it, it's really great help absolutely all right. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. And I want to have another show sometime in the future. I want to talk more about smart dust, where everything's going, nanotech, all of this, because you had so much information to share today and really appreciate it. It's been fun. And I'll be very happy to meet you again sometime in the future. Great.
Well, thank you everyone for tuning in today to the Future Now show. Check out links below for more information and we'll see you in the future.